morning everyone. Good morning. Um, my name is Pierre Pietschteig and we record this video on the cover of International Nations Daily. Today our guest is Francesca Trupia, who is a PhD candidate at the Sofia University, St. Clement uh, Opritsky. Uh, Francesco is a research fellow at IASA, Institute for Islamic uh, Strategic Affairs, fellow at Alpha Institute of, of Geopolitics and Intelligence, uh, formerly a fellow at CRC Armenia, Francesco is deeply engaged in various local NGOs in Balkan uh, region and Eastern Europe. He has cooperated with with number of them, uh, both Serbia, uh, Bulgaria, Ukraine, and of course Armenia. Nagorno Karabakh, Azerbaijan, Armenia. Uh, you are deeply interested in geopolitics, a uh, post-Soviet affairs, conflict resolution strategies, and. A minorities and today we will basically talk about Nagorno-Karabakh conflict and we will explore various issues related to, to this conflict. How you put it, the relations between Armenia and Azerbaijan have been frozen for quite some time and uh, in recent days the time bomb has exploded again and uh, just to just to uh, let you know Nagorno-Karabakh from the perspective of Mr. Trupia is one of the longest still ongoing uh, military confrontations in Europe and one of the most vigorous confrontations in the former Soviet sphere. So could you tell me in a nutshell a little bit more about this conflict from your perspective? Okay, okay. thanks Piet for the for this interview, first of all. Mm -hmm. uh, well, in general, we can say that actually the nagorno karabakh as you told like before, a few, few seconds before, mm -hmm. is the longest conflict in Europe. Mm -hmm. I know that it sounds weird because actually uh, we are mentioning Europe Mm -hmm. Even if the conflict is just taking place in the South Caucasus, which, in, I mean, in the common idea is no Europe at all. But actually, we have to stress this point of view because actually both Armenia and Azerbaijan, which are uh, involved in the conflict, they are state member of the Eastern European Agreement. Mm -hmm. So somehow they are dealing with the European Union platform. Even from the European Union side, there is not too much interest. And I wonder that actually many economic lobbies and interests are going to, to, to cover the conflict of Nagorno-Karabakh in an unvoiced position. There are many French, Western institutions, English, Italian as well, which are just making business with Azerbaijan because of the Caspian Sea, because of the gas resources, and actually dealing or making a cooperation with our political regime still in transition I think it's not very transparent uh, for, from the Western institutions or for the Western lobbies as well. Of course, the Euro, if we are going to, to start talking about this kind of legal framework, mm -hmm. we have to say that the Euro, Nagorno-Karabakh, I mean the Armenian um, region uh, today uh, occupied by of Azerbaijan, Mm -hmm. But de facto, because we are talking about a de facto entity in the South Caucasus, uh, of course there is nothing to say in according with, uh, with Azerbaijan and at the same time uh, between Navigating Europe and at the same time uh, it's still ongoing. Mm -hmm. In political terms we can specify and we can describe the conflict as a frozen conflict but this kind of frozen position is just inability to solve the problem, to unfreeze the problem. Uh, many experts, political uh, scientists or like other PhD researchers, um, they have been paying attention on how to unfreeze the conflict. Mm -hmm. And actually it's very difficult because uh, neither Azerbaijan nor Armenia mm -hmm. uh, is ready to compromise over the conflict. They are in a frozen position. For Armenians, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh is part of the motherland mm -hmm. and squarely it's, it's part of their nationhood, the idea of the nationhood. Especially because for Armenians this kind of issue is so important. Armenians have been suffering after, uh, during the First World War uh, because of the um, Turkish genocide in 1915, so they have basically lost the Western Armenia, what they call Western Armenia, which is actually the eastern part of Turkey, uh, in which the population is Kurdish right now. And then they have lost, during the Sovietization of the Caucasus, of the South Caucasus, the region of Natijewan, which is an ex-slave, an Azeric slave, was allocated 
doing the Sovietization process uh, to Azerbaijan. Mm. And still, right now. Could you tell me more about this particular issue with you know, Joseph Stalin's policy in the region? Because not everyone is familiar well, with what's, yeah, yeah, what actually, did happen back Actually, back it's then. a very long story. Um, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Garfield. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's say that during the Sovietization of, 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 of the South Caucasus, which was the outskirts of the Soviet Empire, let's say, sure. and neighboring. Uh, the, the NATO area, especially after the 1954, if I'm not mistaken, when Turkey joined the NATO organization, um, the South Caucasus became so important for, for Soviet administration. There are many ethnic issues for uh, the South Caucasus, even if we are talking about Nagorno-Karabakh. Nagorno-Karabakh was um, occupied by Christian populations like Armenians, mm -hmm. Even Albanians, of course, not Albanians from from Albania. I mean, Albania the Balkans, mm -hmm. um, but Albanians like nomadic people uh, crossing borders, living in Nagorno-Karabakh, and they have been uh, very close to to Armenian population. They became more or less the same population. Even Armenians consider Albanians a little bit different from, from them, of course, and it's a different point of view. And then the, the region became uh, Persian. Mm -hmm. That's why, for instance, Nagorno-Karabakh is made by two different meanings. One is Nagorno from Russian language, and Karabakh it means like Berg Garden from the Persian language. Mm -hmm. And, and Nagorno-Karabakh was allocated to Azerbaijan. Sure. It was just a win win strategy for the Soviet mm -hmm. administration in order to take sure. control more and more of the administration mm -hmm. and even the person who were in charge of this kind of discussion in the South Caucasus between Armenians and, and Azerbaijan, they were just trying to, uh, to make uh, in a peace position, in a peaceful position, uh, the, the Nagorno-Karabakh populace in order to control and the And that's just very plays a great role in in situations like that, so it's a major source of disagreements between the countries. We can see this situation in Syria, in Ukraine, in you know, Yemen, or mm -hmm. Egypt. Uh, the different um, ethnic groups don't tend to live peacefully with each other for various of reasons. But what interests me deeply is the, the question, how come the conflict which was basically uh, frozen for 20, 25 years, has now broke out. It's like in August we saw the massive uh, outbreak of the conflict and that happened out of nowhere. What's your intake on this situation? Actually, um, uh, I think you are wrong when you are saying that Nagorno Karabakh was a frozen conflict. Mm -hmm. It was just a frozen because there is um, there is no way how to, to, to make uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan in in a position to compromise between each other and mm -hmm. to understand what exactly is going on and sure. how to unfreeze the conflict. Mm -hmm. There are there are many strategies, mm -hmm. uh, but actually uh, all of them have been spoiling when they try to be applied over the region. Sure. So actually, I'm just in I'm turning your position of frozen conflict into a, a new idea of the conflict, like a frozen relationship. Sure, of course, between Armenia and Azerbaijan. So it mean, was not frozen at all. What I mean is that there is a difference between 1988, 1994, and 1994 until 2016. Well, in, in recent there was the, the ceasefire agreement mm -hmm. um, in Bishkek, mm -hmm. um, in which basically Armenia and Azerbaijan decide to stop fighting each other. Mm -hmm. But of course, right now there is a war. The war is still ongoing, mm -hmm. especially. Um, uh, after the 1994, there have been violations mm -hmm. of the ceasefire agreement from both sides. I, I don't want to say that actually there is just Azerbaijan with just uh, violating the ceasefire agreement. Mm -hmm. um, Armenians as well, in order to protect their motherland, they mm -hmm. are living in this idea of sure. protection of the motherland, of the idea of nationhood. And there are line of contacts. Mm -hmm which means that actually there are uh, military positions in which Armenian soldiers and Azerbaijani soldiers, they face each other in order to understand if something is going wrong and they are ready to fight. And over the last 
years, especially in 2016, early April 2016, there was a huge and a massive violation from Azerbaijan side, of course, in the, in the northeastern part of, of the region, in the village of Kalish, for instance, in which there have been taking place many human rights violations. Um, of course, there was a reaction uh, from the Armenian side, and that's why in, in the conflict, in the history of the conflict of Nagorno-Karabakh, this kind of escalation is called the Second War. Mm -hmm. Because uh, after the 1994, after the two years of war between 92 and 94, uh, and after the Bishkek Agreement, for sure it was the highest um, and the worst situation in Nagorno-Karabakh. That's why actually there is a new kind of uh, reimagining the, the war because the war is still ongoing and the escalation in 2016, early April 2016, shows that actually Azerbaijan is ready to attack Nagorno-Karabakh and of course Armenians are ready to, to defend. So this what has triggered that? Well, there are many opinions, many ideas mm -hmm. about who pushed the button yeah. in order to restart. Who pushed the button? Who pushed the button? Uh, it was a perfect time for Azerbaijan to turn public attention to Nagorno-Karabakh. Francesco, mm -hmm. uh, tell me a little bit about the region itself, because we have this perception that something might unfold, there is a ticking bomb uh, waiting to uh, basically explode. We have Georgia and Russia with very tense relations. We have um, Armenia, uh, Turkey, we have Azerbaijan and um, Armenia. Uh, in the very close neighborhood there is uh, Iraq, Syria um, and um, various jihadist movements uh, in the region. Can you tell me how do you perceive the region? What what well, might happen in this, in this region the, in the, the forthcoming south, years? The South Caucasus is one of the most interesting regions mm -hmm. if you're going to, to study international relations mm -hmm. because actually you can, you, you can understand the region as one of the, the, the most important part for uh, further cooperation uh, between Europe and the South Caucasus uh, or even the South Caucasus and the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Basically, we have three uh, de facto entities. Mm -hmm. uh, two of them are in Georgia, South Ossetia and Abkhazia, uh -huh. in which Russia, of course, is playing a very important role. And, of course, we have the Nagorno-Karabakh. Nagorno At the same time, we have the issue with, with Nakichevan, which mm -hmm. is a slave, an Azeric slave. Um, of course, Armenians have been campaigning a lot in order to reallocate mm -hmm. Nakijevan to, to Armenia. Sure. And of course, we have uh, a very interesting relationship between Turkey and Armenia. And what do I mean? I mean that actually there are a reconciliation process mm -hmm. between Turkey and, and Armenia. But of course, once again, mm -hmm. neither Armenia nor Turkish is ready to compromise about a very important issue, which is the issue of the genocide. Mm -hmm. that has been taking place in 1915, mm -hmm. when Armenians have been murdered and they moved from the Western uh, Armenia, what they call Western Armenia, which is today the eastern part of Turkey, mm -hmm. the historically Anatolia, the region of Anatolia. Um, so basically, in this kind of reconciliation process, um, the Turkish institution are not going to recognize the genocide as mm -hmm. genocide. Sure. From the other side, Armenians say it was a genocide. You can call it whatever you want, uh, in the way you want, but actually it was a genocide, basically. And this kind of reconciliation process is just stuck in the middle without moving mm -hmm. to any direction. Um, of course, we have um, frozen relationships between Armenia and Azerbaijan because of the conflict. We have um, economic uh, cooperations between Azerbaijan and Georgia mm -hmm. because of the gas pipelines, mm -hmm. like the DAP. Supported by the EU the, very strongly. Exactly. Um, which is not very uh, welcomed in Moscow. President Putin is not seeing it as a uh, great 
friendly move from, from the perspective of Brussels, but well, well, that's totally different matter. Yeah, it's a different matter, and sometimes, you know, um, I mean, the European effort on mm -hmm. the construction of the, mm -hmm. of the gas pipeline sure. and it was just uh, uh, the second choice of the European Union after um, after the project of the South Stream here in the Balkans mm -hmm. uh, because of the section against Russia they moved uh, the interest, the economic interest from the Balkans to the South Caucasus in order to, to get involved with the sure. Azerbaijan from the gas energies from, from the Caspian Sea um, so and once again, uh, having a look at the region, um, so we have closer relationships between Turkey and Armenia, sure. closer relationships between Armenia and Azerbaijan. We have a uh, new relationship between Turkey and Georgia, and in turn between Georgia and Azerbaijan because of the gas pipelines and for the for the projects. And at the same time, we have a good relationship between Armenians. Uh, and Georgians, of course, between uh, Georgia and Armenia, because of the relationships uh, Georgia is having with Azerbaijan and Turkey, Armenia is not very, <laughs> very happy about it, let's say. That's, it's that's very dynamic and relations, it's, basically. It's very dynamic because, in turn, Armenia is very close to Russia, of course, and and this kind of relationships are not going to take consideration Georgia because uh, Georgia has some um, something to do with Russia because of uh, the region of Kafkazia and South Ossetia. So you know, it's a very difficult situation in the South Caucasus because of the de facto entities in which there are conflicts still ongoing. Because the diplomatic relationships between the three Caucasian republics are not very, very, very good, um, and they they are not going to step forward. If something is going, is going to change actually over the region, I think it's going to change toward a very uh, worse situation. And of course it's a mad situation at the same time, so you cannot solve the problem between uh, Armenia and, and Azerbaijan if you're not going to solve the problem sure. in Nagorno-Karabakh. And once again, what about Nagorno-Karabakh? Um, shall we recognize Nagorno-Karabakh as this uh, as state? And what uh, what is Azerbaijan is thinking about this kind of situation. Of course, Azerbaijan is not ready to compromise about the situation of Nagorno-Karabakh. Why Armenia, for instance, doesn't recognize Nagorno-Karabakh as a state, which is something very, very weird, because Armenia is supporting during the People's First Coalition Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh region, because of course in Nagorno-Karabakh just Armenians are living over there and uh, Georgia is not just, just very carefully uh, trying to, to, to control its position uh, over, over the conflict because on one hand Georgia doesn't want to to, to, to destroy the economic interest with Azerbaijan, mm -hmm. at the same time Georgia doesn't want to um, to destroy like the diplomatic relationship with, uh, with with Armenia because actually in Georgia there is a very important Armenia minority, mm -hmm. especially living in the southern part of Georgia, which is very close to the national border. And you know when minorities are living nearby national borders. And their mother motherland or they stay just over there on the other side. Some 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 tough situation. Sure. So tell me as far as local capitals, local governments in Tbilisi, uh, Baku or Yerevan, uh, how do they see the recent Russian uh, well, activity in uh, Caspian Sea firing rockets from its naval towards Syria? Uh, do, you, do you think that's, um, that also adds to the tensions in the, in the region? Well, right now there are, for instance, if you are going to speak about the, the conflict in Syria and the position of Russia over the conflict in Syria, uh, because of the war, there are many uh, Armenian Syrians who are just uh, escaping from, from Syria and they are going to, to Armenia. 
some of them uh, went to, to Nagorno-Karabakh region because you know here once again Nagorno-Karabakh is part of the idea of Armenians and for them it's just the motherland so it doesn't matter if there is a conflict uh, with, with Azerbaijan, it's a dangerous, let's say, a dangerous sure. region. Uh, they don't care too much. They are Armenians, they feel to be Armenian, so they go to Nagorno Karabakh very easily. And of course, Armenian forces, they control the Lachin Corridor, which is the corridor uh, in geographical terms, which connects Nagorno Karabakh, the enclave of the, so the former Soviet enclave of, of, of Karabakh with, with Armenia. And what we, according to the Jure the jurisdiction, we sure. call Armenia. So, um, of course, Georgians uh, had some some issue with with, with Russia, it was sure. with the Russians because of the conflict in Abkhazia and in South Ossetia. And Armenians, well, but of course, they are former. Uh, Soviet countries, so let's say that society is mostly bilingual. They speak, for instance, Russian, which is a very, very important cultural issue. Of course, and uh, Armenians, they they used to speak Russian very easily. It's it's a problem in Georgia because you know because of the war, because of the position of Russia. Yeah, of course, once again, history. We have to remember that actually Stalin was Georgian. Of course, um, and Georgians have been suffering um, the most. Yes, during his rule. Yeah, it's it, it's a mad situation. So you know, one of the father of the Soviet Union was Joseph Stalin, and at the same time he was Georgian. And it's not like Khrushchev who given Crimea to Ukraine. Stalin was a little bit more nastier to yeah. Georgian. Yeah, yeah. But that, leave, it, leave it aside. I know that you've been living in Nagorno Karabakh when you were a researcher, um, basically at uh, CRC Armenia. You had a first hand experience with living in the conflict zone. Could you tell me more about your experiences uh, from, from that region? Could you tell me about the experiences of local people? How do you perceive it? Of course, when you are like going to, to Nagorno Karabakh, I mean, there is no war everywhere. I mean, it, it's you you feel to be safe in Nagorno Karabakh. Yeah. Even when you hear the uh, gunshots and Kamashiko. well, you, you should go like in Stepanakert, uh -huh. the de facto capital of, of Nagorno of Nagorno Karabakh, the Republic of Artsakh. Um, I mean, there is no war. I mean, mm -hmm. you can understand this. Uh, recollection of the idea of war almost mm. everywhere. Sure. I remember I've been there after the, the escalation of every, every April in 2016 and there was this strange celebration of the 9th May, which is the day of the victory. Sure. And it's celebrated because of course we are talking about the former Soviet region. And the, I remember there was um, uh, a place in, in the main square of, of Stepanakert, which there was an exhibition of pictures mm -hmm. from the line of contacts. Mm -hmm. And the exhibition were just trying to combine the, the view of the first war between 1992 and 1994 with the second war, which took place in early April 2016. Sure. And this kind of recollection, how to, how to to say this kind of idea of the world and fighting for the motherland and going to the line of contact in order to defend your motherland is totally present in the Armenian consciousness. Sure. You know, fighting for Nagorno Karabakh is a part of, of the Armenianness, which is a term used in the constitution of Armenia. They have the idea of Armenianness. And it's very interesting, actually, because you can understand easily if a person is Armenian from the surname, for instance, mm -hmm. because they have the suffix "yan." But that's very common in Eastern Europe. And so yeah, but actually, you know, in, the, in, in the Armenian background, because of the past, because they have to defend their community, they are living in this mm -hmm. um, communitarian cycle. Sure. So to be Armenian means 
that you have to do something for your mom to be ready to, and to do and your to, 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 yeah exactly but exactly. similar yeah. similar uh, like similar approach to see in Israel or it's in Lebanon as well so there there is a, you can you can connect the dots between for instance the, the, there have been some attempt by um, political experts or political thinkers to connect Nagorno Karabakh the situation in Nagorno Karabakh with Kosovo sure you know, because Kosovo was part of Serbia. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was like in the in the Yugoslavia, of course. And in like the Soviet, the Soviet administration of Nagorno Karabakh. Then there was the war. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was the Kosovo takeover. Mm -hmm. So the, the region of Kosovo became a state. Actually, it's a recognized state. Well, by George W. Bush, that that was his last executive yes, order. I'm not going to in, in details with the Kosovo. Mm -hmm. The Kosovo War, but at the same time, you know, uh, there was something. But I think it's 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 different. It's a unique case. When you're talking about Nagorno Karabakh, it's something different. You have to understand first of all what exactly went wrong with two populations which have been sharing the everyday life during the Soviet administration, and then something went wrong. And um, speaking in political terms, you have to understand that actually, of course, Armenia and Azerbaijan are not ready to compromise over the region. Mm -hmm. uh, they are just stuck on the middle, in their position. Nagorno Karabakh is part of Armenia. From the Azerbaijani side, Nagorno Karabakh is our mother. We have to mm -hmm. take control over the region. Sure. And living in Nagorno Karabakh for Armenians, uh, and this is like the worst part of. Of, the, of, of, of your studying, if you are, of your studies, if you are going to study Nagorno Karabakh, is that actually Armenians they are living under the pressure of the war without having uh, an idea how to live peacefully far away from the war. So, of course, um, almost everyone, civilians living in Nagorno Karabakh, they have lost some relatives in the war, husbands, sons. Um, even like some civilians who, mm -hmm. who are living nearby the line of contact, mm -hmm. like the, the, the village of Talish, or from the Azerbaijani side, like uh, the village of Tartar. Or, I mean, the, the, there are civilians living uh, alongside the line of contact, and it's the war in Nagorno Karabakh. It's not just a military operation. Sure. It's, it's going to, to shape uh, a national identity. That's why, for instance, uh, if you take a look at the last presidents of Armenia, mm -hmm. you, can, you can understand very easily that actually every president of Armenia was born in Istepanakert, for instance, in Nagorno Karabakh. Mm -hmm. they, they have been fighting. The and it's, they are squarely connected each other. And even from in, in Azerbaijan, the Eli family, for instance, is coming from Nakijevan, which is the slave allocated to, to Azerbaijan, but there is no connection between Nakijevan and Azerbaijan. So people living, I mean, Azerbaijanis living in Nakijevan, in order to, to get Azerbaijan, they have to, or to go to Turkey, mm -hmm. in order to avoid Armenia, and then go up to Georgia and go down to Azerbaijan, mm -hmm. or they have to go like from, from, I mean, from, from the south part, like uh, from the Kijavan to Iran, mm -hmm. and then going yeah. up to Azerbaijan. I found it quite interesting when uh, I was reading your article, your recent article about the study group which you conducted, basically, about uh, Azeri and Armenian uh, men or women uh, responding to the question whether you are keen to marry um, the Armenian or uh, Azerbaijani uh, counterpart, basically, and the response was quite negative. Could you elaborate on that one? Like 95% of, yeah. of, of, of the people, yeah. Okay, um, when I was mentioning mm -hmm. the fact that actually we have to speak up about Nagorno Karabakh, mm -hmm. but not like in terms of frozen conflict, because the conflict is not frozen at all. Actually, the mm -hmm. violation of the ceasefire agreement, they were married, mm -hmm. they were this kind of multicultural families. Mm -hmm. Of course, during the Soviet time, Armenians had Azeri relatives and vice versa. Mm -hmm. But right now, mm -hmm. and this is the problem of the national identity of Armenians and mm -hmm. Azerbaijanis, 
they have the younger generation they have no experience in sharing the everyday life with, mm -hmm. with others. That's why when the Caucasus Resource Research Institute uh, has been conducting this research about like the role of the, the day groups in, in the South Caucasus, mm -hmm. the, the answer was very, very negative. It means something more, I mean, mm -hmm. not just about the marriage, mm -hmm. but you had to, to go be, deeper. Be deeper and behind mm -hmm. the marriage. It means that actually they hate there each is other. Hostility. There is hostility. And they are not able to, 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 to meet the other, mm -hmm. and to start living with the other, even to start dating with the sure. other. Uh, That's in, in a very romantic way, but this is basically what, what I mean when there, there is a, a, a frozen relation between when there is a frozen relationship between Armenians and Azerbaijanis. Which is going to, to take place when the conflict will be over. Do you think that if similar uh, study was conducted in Ukraine nowadays, uh, the response would be similar? Well, once again, the Gono Karabakh is a little bit different from the situation in Cyprus, um, in Ukraine right now. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the conflict is going to shape. Uh, national identity, na national identity uh, is going to to play a very important role in the mm -hmm. social life. Mm -hmm. That's why, for instance, that's out of the question, basically. I remember when you told me about the situation when you actually met a foreign tourist who was <laughs> passing by a flow in Nagorno-Karabakh and he didn't really know that there was a conflict going on. Can yeah. you tell me more about yeah. the situation okay. again? When I was in, in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh -huh. I was visiting the province of Hadrut, okay. which is in the south part of Nagorno-Karabakh. Okay. When I say to you that there is a lack of information about Nagorno-Karabakh in Europe... You mean that, you mean that basically. Yeah. Exactly. And so I remember I was visiting one of the oldest church in the province of Hadrut, and I was surprised to, to meet a German guy mm -hmm. passing through Nagorno Karabakh cycling on his bicycle. From, yeah, uh, on his bicycle from Iran mm -hmm. to uh, passing through Nagorno Karabakh in direction of Armenia. Mm -hmm. But you know, he was not he didn't realize that there is a war ongoing. He was not pretty sure about the situation of Nagorno what was going on uh -huh. and even in that region was very I mean it was a safe place mm -hmm. you know if you're going to take the wrong direction and you're not going in the direction of the Panaka for instance but you're going to the other direction and you're going to, uh, to the direction of the line of contact you know so of this and sound this something kind might of happen to you uh, yeah this kind of meeting I have had and in 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 Nagorno Karabakh mm -hmm. um, made me the position that of course we have to speak up about the Nagorno Karabakh because there is a lack of information. Mm -hmm. Even when you ask to some European, uh, what is Nagorno Karabakh? Of course, he starts having a look at the map, but actually Nagorno Karabakh is not recognized, so it's not. If you are familiar with the region, of course, you can recognize. You say, okay, it's here it's between Armenia and Azerbaijan, it's the Armenian region occupied by Armenian forces, about Armenian civilians, but at the same time, you are far away from this background, from these studies. Uh, you know, you even don't know where is Armenia or Azerbaijan. So, um, and of course, it's a European issue because actually Armenia and Azerbaijan are state members of the Eastern European Union. So we have, because actually we have, you know, the process of migrations. Um, we have this enlargement of the European Union platform with 27 countries inside, and of course Armenia. Now 27 after after Brexit. Uh, oh. Yes, sure. <laughs> After Brexit, yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and of course, you know, when there is, it's very tricky to see how politicians mm -hmm. are raising awareness among public opinion mm -hmm. about like the Christian values sometimes. Mm -hmm. And you know, the first nation which adopted Christianity was Armenia. Of course. Of but course. no one in Europe is talking about the situation of Karabakh. And when you know, when you and in the meantime, we have we are bombarded uh, 
uh, with the information from Iraq, from Syria, um, and that basically focuses people's attention towards this conflict. And in the meantime, conflict, uh, conflicts like Nagorno Karabakh or Central Africa or, or yeah. South Sudan, we we hear nothing about that. Or Yemen. Have you heard about uh, anything from, well, actually, from this? Yemen, more or less, is just in the political mainstream right yeah. now because the situation is yeah. going to be like sure. But in the time being, you know, when there are some NGOs or organizations, Christian organizations, speaking about like how Christians are persecuted in Nigeria or in mm -hmm. sub-Saharan Africa yeah. or like in Middle East, mm -hmm. uh, like Christians from Syria, mm -hmm. they are not talking about Nagorno Karabakh, and mm -hmm. you know it's a Christian population. And I, I won't say that actually we have. To so do they feel left out actually? Uh, sure. Is there this feeling in the in Armenian state that basically no one cares about us? There is this negative thought of which Armenians have in their mind. They have been so. That might be quite frustrating to. It's frustrating for from them, of course, because you know they they are close with Russians, but they are not living in the Soviet time. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, when there was the peak of escalation in mm -hmm. 2016, and we have um, I've seen in Yerevan the first uh, protest in front of the Russian embassy. Okay. Because actually they understood that the weapons and used by Azerbaijanis mm -hmm. against Armenians living in Nagorno Karabakh, uh -huh. living in the region of Nagorno Karabakh, um, those weapons were Russian weapons. Mm -hmm. Weapons made in Russia, uh, which in turn Russia uh, has sent to Azerbaijan because the South Caucasus is part, it's like a kind of buffer zone mm -hmm. between the NATO area and the Russian Federation. Sure. And we know that actually if um, the idea of the Soviet uh, Empire is very far away right mm -hmm. now because, I mean, the Soviet Union doesn't st exist anymore. I feel, you know, the South Caucasus is understood from the Russian side as a buffer zone. Mm -hmm. A buffer zone, very tricky, very complicated to, to, to deal with because we have conflict. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now, with the referendum which was held in, in February, which Armenians from Nagorno Karabakh they decide to change the name from Republic of Nagorno Karabakh to Republic of Artsakh. Okay. Once again, another connection with the history. Because Artsakh right. was uh, a province of the Great Armenian Empire. Maybe uh, Russia uh, might be under the pressure more and more in order to solve the, the conflict of, of Nagorno Karabakh. Of course, Russia cannot solve by itself the problem, the problem of Nagorno Karabakh because Russia is uh, taking place in the Minsk group. But at the same time, I think Russia is just trying to to, uh, to control the state, the status quo mm -hmm. over the region uh, because. Russia is dealing with Azerbaijan and at the same time with Armenia in terms of the conflict. Even cultural issues are going to, to make closer and closer. So, do you think that the Kremlin has hidden agenda to like, supply oh, of weapons of to Azerbaijan it's to fuel the conflict? It's not just economic interest. Yeah. It's an economic interest. So, do you think that Britain has similar interest to? And um, well, to, for Yemeni conflict to exactly. carry on, to, to sell their weapons to to, uh, to the local government, and the USA and has Iraq, interest in, right now. in carrying on the conflict in Iraq. To I mean, Iraq, not that they make any money out of selling selling weapons to the Iraqi going, government. Going a little bit out from the issue of Nagorno Karabakh, um, why, for instance, the Turkeys? Paying a lot of attention uh, in the region of Rojava, mm -hmm. which is controlled by Kurdish population, mm -hmm. in which the Kurdish population has been fighting against the Islamic State. Mm -hmm. Why? Because actually, by the way, Kurds are, are supported uh, with the weapons from Germany. So. Okay, we are just going to to dig into to, to, to conspiracy theories.
No, it's not a conspiracy, it's just reality. It's it is reality. It is reality because the five permanent members of UN Security Council happen to be the five biggest exporters of the weapons in the world. So it it tells you a lot about their um, well motivations to well, go with the peace agenda around and the world. For instance, when Russia is selling weapons to Azerbaijan, it tells you a lot about the relationship between Russia and the South Caucasus, mm -hmm. and how Russia is taking place mm -hmm. and is defending itself from the accuse of Armenians saying, come on, you are selling weapons to Azerbaijan, you know, they're gonna use them against us. Yeah, but uh, don't you think that, you know, picturing Russia from the perspective of, like, a bully who is only interested in, in um, making this conflict worse, is a little bit like playing into Western uh, cards. Russia also has some sort of um, reputation in the conflict, and both sides tend to listen to whatever President Putin says. Can you agree to that? The ceasefire agreement in mm -hmm. um, April 2016 was reached in, in Moscow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm and uh, in front of the President Putin. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an important partner for, for Azerbaijan for both, uh, and for, uh, for Armenia, yes. but at the same time, that's why I was just trying to pay attention about how political elites are manipulating the conflict, are just trying to survive the conflict uh, in order to gain more and more audience from, from the national population. Mm -hmm. I mean, the rule of Russia right now is is a very huge discussion, is a very huge issue, especially in the post-Soviet uh, countries, even in Moldova, you know, mm -hmm. with the problem of Transnistria. Oh, Transnistria is a totally different issue, but, but uh, you, can different, you can draw you can certain say, comparisons. Yeah, you can, you can draw some comparisons with mm -hmm. And that's why. On behalf of International Relations Daily, it was Piotr Pietrzak. Thank you very much for your attention.